Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the American Heart Association's Chief Executive Officer, Nancy Brown. Welcome to Chicago and the American Heart Association Scientific Sessions, the world's preeminent cardiovascular science meeting. Thank you for joining us. We're honored that so many esteemed scientists and clinicians have come together to share ideas, expertise, and passion. The people in this room are pushing the boundaries of science to save lives, truly mankind's most noble pursuit. On behalf of the American Heart Association, I thank you for your efforts. As you know, cardiovascular diseases and stroke are the world's leading causes of death but they can be defeated through science. The scientific journey requires courage and dedication because the destination cannot be guaranteed. However, it can be envisioned, and that vision is critical to the many patients urgently in need of answers, as well as to the many people who would rather not become patients. Our scientific journey to defeat cardiovascular diseases and stroke brings to mind one of my favorite quotes, written some 200 years ago by William Blake. What is now proved was once only imagined. Everything you experience at scientific sessions reflects our shared commitment to the acceleration and advancement of science toward the proving of what once was imagined. Over the next four days, you will have the opportunity to observe, discuss, and share the very latest developments in cardiovascular and stroke research. In all, nearly 20,000 people are attending scientific sessions from more than 110 countries. A meeting like this would not be possible without the outstanding work of the American Heart Association's Committee on Scientific Sessions Program. The committee is led by Chairman Dr. Robert Harrington of Stanford University and Vice Chairman Dr. Frank Selke of Brown University. Will you please join me in a round of applause for Drs. Harrington, Selke, and the entire Committee on Scientific Sessions Program. And now it's my honor to introduce Dr. Elliot Antman, who will deliver his presidential address. Dr. Antman is a professor of medicine and associate dean for clinical and translational research at Harvard Medical School and senior physician in cardiovascular medicine at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. His leadership is critical to the American Heart Association's efforts to achieve our 2020 strategic impact goal of improving the cardiovascular health of all Americans by 20% and reducing deaths from cardiovascular diseases and stroke by 20%. Please welcome Dr. Elliot Antman. Good afternoon, and welcome to Scientific Sessions. On behalf of all of the American Heart Association's clinicians, scientists, lay volunteers, and staff, I extend a warm welcome and offer my thanks for your efforts to understand, prevent, and treat cardiovascular diseases. We are inspired by your dedication to saving and improving lives. The burden of these diseases is something we all share, no matter where you live or work. So let's make the most of our opportunities to learn from one another throughout scientific sessions. For these next four days, Chicago is home to the latest in cardiovascular and stroke research. And Chicago is also home to significant cardiovascular history. Ninety years ago, Chicago resident Dr. James B. Herrick joined Dr. Paul Dudley White and four other pioneering physicians at Chicago's Drake Hotel to create the American Heart Association. 
They started this life-saving organization just four miles away from where you're sitting right now. Yet, it was worlds away when you consider what we can offer patients today. We now have tools at our disposal that we could barely imagine only a few years ago. New diagnostic and therapeutic options are being discovered at a pace unseen in human history. We have an unprecedented opportunity to harness these advances to save and improve lives. And that is what I would like to talk to you about. But first, I would like to share a quick illustration of just how much our tools have changed. This 28-pound box is the actual ECG machine Paul Dudley White used in his office decades ago. It was considered state-of-the-art back then, with the patient lying supine and connected to the device, a paper recording of the ECG could be obtained a single lead at a time. Now let's compare that to how we gather similar information today. Patients simply place their fingertips on these little metal plates attached to a smartphone case and record their own lead one rhythm strip. And instead of lying down in the doctor's office, patients can do this from anywhere in the world. The remote village in the Dominican Republic shown in this slide is just such an example. Few people here have electricity, but ECG tracings were easily recorded on smartphones and transmitted to a research team at a U.S. hospital in just a few seconds, proving the concept that remote acquisition of ECGs is possible. How do we best take advantage of the rapidly changing technologies and the seemingly endless array of big data engulfing us and translate it into practical applications for the everyday care of our patients around the world? This is a critical question. Heart disease and stroke remain the leading causes of death in the world, taking more than 17 million lives annually. That figure is expected to surpass 23 million by 2030. Leading cardiology organizations around the world have set bold goals to deal with the burden of cardiovascular diseases. We all know we can save and improve lives with evidence-based treatments and a focus on prevention. But we also know that even our very best efforts at implementing them more widely will not be sufficient. Yet the solution is within our grasp, which is why we are all here. We have come to Chicago to discuss how scientific research can most rapidly uncover and implement new therapies. And I believe that to accelerate the pace of discovery, we need more than just science as usual. We need disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovation is a concept introduced by Harvard Business School professor Clayton Christensen. It occurs when a new development has an unexpected and profound impact on how we live and work. For example, landlines gave way to cell phones, which gave birth to the smartphone, which is an all-in-one tool, like a modern-day Swiss Army knife, for patients and members of the healthcare community alike. Now, here's an example from my own practice. A 67-year-old patient was referred to me for evaluation of palpitations that were not diagnosed despite multiple prior 12-lead ECGs using the modern version of a machine like Paul Dudley White's, ambulatory monitoring sessions, and exercise tests. 
I prescribed a heart rhythm monitoring device, like the one on the smartphone I demonstrated a moment ago. He recorded several tracings at home and work, and then he emailed them to me. They showed recurrent episodes of atrial fibrillation. And so, very quickly, and with the help of technology, I could formulate a therapeutic plan. My patient is one of about 33 and a half million people around the world affected by atrial fibrillation, which increases their stroke risk fivefold and drastically increases health care costs. The number of patients with atrial fibrillation is expected to grow dramatically because it occurs with greater prevalence in elderly people, a rapidly growing segment of our population. For over half a century, we have treated atrial fibrillation with the standard oral anticoagulant, warfarin. The story behind the development of warfarin is actually a wonderful illustration of disruptive innovation. In February 1933, a farmer in Wisconsin noticed his cows developed a severe and often fatal bleeding problem after eating sweet clover hay. Looking for answers, one snowy Saturday, he loaded his truck with hay from his barn, drove about 240 miles to Madison, Wisconsin, and ended up meeting agricultural biochemist Paul Link. Researchers in Dr. Link's lab, we're already familiar with coumarin, a naturally occurring hydrocarbon found on the shaft of sweet clover hay. They discovered that when the hay became wet, a fermentation reaction fused two molecules of coumarin, and the resulting compound was the source of the bleeding. They named it dicoumarol, and advised the farmer not to feed his cows any more wet hay. Because the researchers recognized the potential benefit of drugs to inhibit the coagulation system, they synthesized various derivatives, including one that proved to be an even more potent anticoagulant. They named this derivative after the lab's sponsor, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, and the original substance, coumarin. And that's how we got the name, warfarin. So, an effort to save dairy cows led to an innovative drug with dramatic implications for patients. The effectiveness of this therapy in preventing stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation was confirmed decades later. However, as you know, there are difficulties in administering warfarin, food and drug interactions, the need for frequent monitoring, and dose adjustments to optimize anticoagulation. Investigators have long searched for potential replacements, leading to large phase three trials comparing warfarin to novel oral anticoagulants, including the direct thrombin antagonist dabigatran and the specific factor 10A inhibitors, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and didoxaban. Each of these compounds blocks the catalytic center of specific proteins in the coagulation system and went through a lengthy development process. This starts with the initial drug discovery phase, followed by the preclinical phase, and then a series of clinical trials. A typical development program takes about 15 years, with 10,000 compounds originally screened for one that makes it to regulatory approval. And this all costs about a billion US dollars. Clearly, this is a system in need of disruptive innovation. I am very familiar with this process because I've been a Timmy study group investigator for three decades, evaluating multiple new therapeutic agents. I led the team 
that studied idoxaban's effect on stroke and systemic embolic events in the Engage AF TIMI48 study, which Dr. Robert Giuliano presented during scientific sessions last year. We published our findings simultaneously in the New England Journal of Medicine. We studied 21,000 patients and then pooled our data with the results of the three prior trials of novel oral anticoagulants. In that analysis of 72,000 patients, we found that the new drugs are similar to warfarin at preventing ischemic stroke, of great importance to patients. Their use is also associated with a 50% reduction in hemorrhagic stroke. These new drugs have important implications in clinical practice. On the plus side, there is no need for therapeutic drug monitoring or frequent dose adjustment. On the other hand, these medications are quite costly. And approved antidotes are not yet available, although they are being developed and data on some are being presented at this meeting. Now let's think about the two pathways by which oral anticoagulants for atrial fibrillation were introduced into clinical medicine. Warfarin came to us by serendipity. The novel oral anticoagulants were developed through a targeted and expensive approach. Obviously, we can't rely on either method to find effective new therapies. We need innovative and new approaches that do not require chance delivery of tainted hay or billion-dollar projects that span two decades. How might we improve the discovery and preclinical phase of drug development, as well as the clinical trials by which we assess new treatments? It would be useful to focus drug discovery on a systems medicine approach. Here, one synthesizes a network of information from genetic, molecular, and cellular studies and constructs a model that predicts an individual patient's response to treatment, streamlining further testing. We may then extend the observations to subgroups who have a similar profile and ultimately pool that information to develop a picture of how a population of patients might need a range of customized treatments. An important discovery by Professor Yamanaka from Japan represents another innovation that takes us closer to individualized therapy. He found that human skin fibroblasts can be reprogrammed to pluripotent stem cells, known as IPS cells which can then differentiate into specific cell types, including cardiomyocytes. Today, a skin cell can be harvested from a patient with a given disease phenotype. The resultant IPS cells can then differentiate into disease-specific cardiomyocytes. Drug screens can be performed on those cells to identify the most effective regimen for patients with specific disease characteristics. Another intriguing innovation is a novel bioengineering platform referred to as organs on a chip. Here is a slide of a heart on a chip. Neonatal rat cardiomyocytes are layered on a deformable thin elastic film or chip. When the myocytes contract, they cause the film to bend. The chip is placed in a microfluid test chamber where drugs can be infused and electrical currents can be delivered to stimulate the cells. In a proof-of-concept experiment, a dose-response curve for isoproteranol affecting twitch stress is shown. You will hear more about this concept shortly from Dr. Donald Ingber this year's Connor Lecturer, whose presentation will also explore the use of IPS-derived human cardiomyocytes with a specific disease phenotype. 
Now let's consider some new technologies that can enable clinical research. You can do that by simply looking around this room. How many of you are wearing devices that track your heart rate, calories burned, or other physiologic parameters? These sensors communicate with our smartphones, which 75% of us have within five feet of us all the time. Is it possible to use these technologies to conduct clinical research across the biologic continuum, from ideal health to disease? This powerful and novel research platform could allow us to evaluate therapies in ways that were not available a few short years ago. In fact, one important study is already doing just that, the Healthy Heart Study, based out of the University of California at San Francisco. The plan is to enroll one million people worldwide to create a distributed cohort that leverages the internet and mobile technology. Of course, data security measures are in place to protect individual privacy. Participants can link their wireless sensors to the research database and allow real-time acquisition of physiologic measurements. The software interface is being written to link electronic medical records and correlate a subject's data with outcome events. The American Heart Association has a scientific collaboration with the Healthy Heart Study. We are referring participants from our programs, such as Go Red for Women, and in the future, we will be receiving depersonalized data, tracking their progress in Healthy Heart in improving their cardiovascular health. We also plan to conduct randomized trials in this new research environment. I invite you to learn more about the power of embedding randomization in observational studies at Dr. Lars Valentin's Paul Dudley White International Lecture Tuesday at 2 p.m. Now, my final example is a dramatic example, the Cardiovascular Genome Phenome Study, also known as CVGPS, was announced last year at Sessions and is changing the landscape of clinical research. The study began as a collaboration between the American Heart Association and the academic homes of the Framingham Heart Study and the Jackson Heart Study, and it was inspired by our long-standing relationship with the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. CVGPS will provide comprehensive genomic and phenomic information combining data from these landmark studies as well as several other prominent cohort studies. Many areas of investigation will now be possible. For example, the study of phenotypic extremes. This will enable us to understand the biology of individuals affected at a very young age, those affected severely, or those who are protected from disease. Investigators will examine genetic and epigenetic determinants of differences in disease incidence, prevalence, risk, and prognosis, and the response to treatments across ethnicities. Investigators in CVGPS will also provide access to a comprehensive, state-of-the-art biorepository and introduce new e-health approaches to digital data collection. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the very first CVGPS investigators. They are building the future on the power of the past and are following in the footsteps of the American Heart Association's founders in a bold and novel way. Please join me in applause for these investigators and co-investigators. They are, the first, they are the first eight grant awardees in the Cardiovascular Genome Phenome Study. Thank you.
And just imagine what the future would look like if we take advantage of the technologies we've discussed today and those being developed as we speak. We could envision the emerging data from clinical medicine and biomedical research being fed into a knowledge network that could offer new insights into disease. These insights should lead to novel clinical approaches and serve as a resource for basic research. The disruptive innovation exemplified by this continuously updated learning system approach takes us ever closer to the goal of precision medicine for our patients. Big data, like that which will be produced in CVGPS, is so omnipresent that it can be overwhelming. But we need to focus on what it represents and why we are collecting it. Big data and the technologies that help us generate it are our modern day tools for finding innovative new ways to save and improve lives for our patients. We must also use our tools and data to inform our future advocacy and prevention strategies to create a culture of health where ideal cardiovascular health is the norm. This is a state that should be enjoyed by everyone. Why has the American Heart Association invested in CVGBS? And why are our researchers tackling the challenges of big data? Why are we involved in the Healthy Heart Study and looking deeper into ways to harness technology and data, in addition to the many other things the organization does to save and improve lives? It's simple. We do these things so people can live longer, healthier lives, so they can endure more of life's precious moments. Moments that truly matter here in the languages of the attendees at this meeting is the answer. Life. Life is why. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to introduce the chairman of the board for the American Heart Association, Bernie Dennis. Elliot, thank you. You know, this is where you have to read the script. So. The Chairman's Award honors individual excellence in volunteer service that significantly advances the association's strategic goals. This year's recipient is Dr. Jennifer Mirez, Senior Vice President for Community and Public Health and Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at North Shore Long Island Jewish Medical Center. Medical Director of the Center for Learning and Innovation and Professor of Cardiology and Population Health at Hofstra North Shore Long Island Jewish School of Medicine. Dr. Mirez has been a passionate volunteer for the American Heart Association. She's been a force in fostering diversity and equity in medical education, eliminating disparities in healthcare delivery, and educating women about the risks of heart disease. Her efforts are exemplified in her academic and professional activities through educational programs such as the Red Dress Campaign and her frequent media appearance, appearances in print, television, and radio. She has served on many and multiple initiatives of the American Heart Association for more than 15 years. Dr. Mirrors has been recognized with numerous awards, among them the AHA's Louis B. Russell Memorial Award in 2011 for addressing healthcare disparities and service to minority or underserved communities. 
Dr. Mirez was honored with the New York State Governor's Award for excellence for her work in heart disease among women. She plays a prominent role in her community and nationally, and her longstanding commitment to the American Heart Association is truly inspiring. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Mirez. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Bernie, thank you so much for that kind introduction. I am truly honored to accept this year's Chairman's Award and even more delighted to be presented with the award by our current Chairman, Bernie Dennis, with whom I have the pleasure of serving on the Founders Board of the American Heart Association. Thank you to the nominating committee, the entire AHA team, my esteemed colleagues of the Clinical Cardiology Council, all of the dedicated volunteers of the American Heart Association, my friends at NYU Langone, and my North Shore LIJ health system family. This past September 11th, I was driving to work and was actually listening to my daughter's favorite radio station, Z100. Nearing the end of my commute, the new song by the singer and songwriter Alicia Keys came on. The song titled, We Are Here, began to play. Her message was simple in its delivery. We are here, we are here for all of us, that's why we are here. The song dovetailed perfectly with the emotions I was experiencing that day. And I knew immediately that I wanted to share with you the theme of volunteerism. We are here for all of us, that's why we are here to help each other and make a difference in the world. Receiving the 2014 Chairman's Award from the American Heart Association is an incredible honor and represents a huge milestone for me on a journey that began long before I even considered a career in medicine. I grew up in Trinidad, surrounded by a family who supported and encouraged me to work hard and believe in my abilities to reach for the stars. My parents were truly global thinkers. They considered themselves citizens of the world. And that perspective had a fundamental impact on how I viewed myself, my career, and my potential to effect change in the world. I grew up with the knowledge that giving back was essential, that to be an observer was not enough, and that knowledge was truly power. My decision at age seven to become a doctor stemmed from the loss of my dearly beloved grandfather who died at 67 from heart disease. My choice of cardiology as a career was influenced and supported by two amazing female cardiologists, Drs. Alice Jacobs and Dr. Judith Hartman, who shared their passion for cardiology and continue to be exemplary role models. My work in women's heart health was inspired by two outstanding clinical researchers, Drs. Nanette Wenger and Dr. Leslie Shaw, who are wonderful friends, colleagues, and mentors. Being a volunteer for the American Heart Association went hand in hand with the mantra of my parents. Being a good doctor was not good enough. I needed to somehow pay it forward and use my skills and my position to help in the drive for equity and education in the delivery of health care. Why we are here is a question we each must face every day. And for every one of us, the answer will be different. We have limitless potential to make a significant difference in the world and to accomplish real change. For me, it's empowering women and their communities to be proactive partners in their health. And to that effect, to sort of elicit a fundamental shift away from the focus on heart disease to a holistic approach of heart health and wellness. And that is one of the reasons that I am here. The statistics have shown that educating and empowering women and their communities about heart health has contributed in part to the decrease in cardiovascular mortality. But ladies and gentlemen, there is still so much work to be done. So that being said, I would now like to ask you to all today to join me in expanding our volunteerism. 
Create that expansion by enlisting your colleagues, friends, and family to pledge at least one hour each month, volunteering in some capacity that advances the mission of the American Heart Association. Deliver a lecture on, at your local community center. Organize a team to walk in a race. There are countless ways to get involved and make a difference. With your support, action, and participation, we can ensure that we meet the American Heart Association's 2020 goal of improving the cardiovascular health of all Americans by 20% and reducing death from cardiovascular diseases and stroke. So once again, to borrow a line from the Alicia Keys song, that is why we are here. Heartfelt thanks to my family, my husband, Haskell, and daughter, Zoe, who are in the audience today. And thank you to my many amazing mentors, my colleagues, and friends. Thanks to Sue Floor and Michael Weimer, special shout out because they encouraged me to get involved, actively involved with the American Heart Association over 14 years ago. So I share this award with all of you as you've been an integral part of my success. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, an important um, saying from the great Winston Churchill resonates with the entire theme of this year's scientific session. We make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Congratulations, Dr. Maris, and thank you, Bernie. Each year, the association confers the Distinguished Scientist designation on members whose innovations have led to far-reaching implications in the field of cardiovascular and stroke research. Let's take a look at this video, which highlights outstanding and groundbreaking careers. The American Heart Association and American Stroke Association's distinguished scientists are a select group whose innovations have led to far-reaching implications in the field of cardiovascular and stroke research. This year, we honor six forward thinkers and their seminal contributions to their fields. The 2014 Distinguished Scientist honorees are Gerald W. Dorn II, M.D. Faha, Dr. Dorn is internationally recognized for his contributions to defining the molecular signaling pathways that govern the development of cardiac hypertrophy and programmed cell death, with special focus on G-protein-coupled receptor signaling cascades. The Dorn Laboratory investigates multiple aspects of genetic reprogramming in heart failure, with research efforts in cardiac signaling, non-coding RNAs, and most recently, mitochondrial mechanisms of heart disease. His recent work is among the first to define the molecular regulation and dynamic alterations in mitochondrial homeostasis in health and disease states using a large array of animal models from fly to mouse. In addition, he led a series of clinical genetics and functional genomics investigations that revealed for the first time a genetic signature for common human heart failure. Dr. Dorn's research spans over 30 years of outstanding accomplishment. Barbara J. Drew, PhD, RN, Faha. Dr. Drew's program of research has influenced standards for accurate electrocardiographic monitoring of patients at risk for arrhythmias, myocardial ischemia, and QT interval prolongation. Her research represents a major breakthrough in knowledge development and has resulted in significant changes in clinical practice with recognizable benefit to the public. In a highly collaborative manner, Dr. Drew made major breakthroughs in cell phone transmitted electrocardiograms for patients who call 911 for chest pain and in ST segment ischemia monitoring in patients admitted to coronary intensive care units. Her studies have informed the development of arrhythmia monitoring algorithms to more accurately detect arrhythmias and reduce false alarms that result in clinical alarm fatigue. Dr. Drew founded the ECG Monitoring Research Laboratory in the School of Nursing at UCSF. Her signature courses are in clinical electrocardiography, which she has taught for more than three decades to medical students, residents, and graduate nursing students. 
Her lectures are known for their relevance to clinical practice and for her underwater photography. Charles T. Esman, PhD, Faha. Dr. Esman's research examines the mechanisms that control the blood clotting process and how they contribute to human disease. He and his collaborators were the first to show that activated protein C could prevent and treat a normally lethal septic response in animals. With collaborator White Owen, they were the first to identify thrombomodulin, and subsequent work from their laboratories led to the isolation and characterization of thrombomodulin. Dr. Esman identified, cloned, and characterized the endothelial cell protein C receptor that serves as a cofactor for thrombomodulin-mediated protein C activation. His laboratory has since identified histones as major mediators of sepsis and activated protein C as a critical regulator of the septic response. Dr. Esman holds 20 patents, several of which have been licensed and are in development by U.S. companies for diagnosis and treatment of vascular diseases involving blood clots. Bruce Fury, MD, Faha. Dr. Fury is a leader in the field of thrombosis and hemostasis with over 300 publications. His research focuses on an interdisciplinary approach to the study of blood coagulation platelet function, and vascular biology. Among his many scientific accomplishments is the major discovery of P-selectin in 1984. This receptor mediates binding of leukocytes to both platelets and endothelial cells. In 1992, he reported in Nature that P-selectin plays a role in thrombosis. More recently, Dr. Fury has developed an in vivo imaging system to visualize clot formation in the blood vessels of mice in real time. This work has provided new insights into the mechanism of clot formation with improved spatial resolution of platelet packing regions and the recognition of the requirement of extracellular thiol isomerases, including protein disulfide isomerase in thrombus formation. William R. Hyatt, MD, Faha. Dr. Hyatt's clinical research career has focused on peripheral artery disease, PAD, and understanding the mechanisms underlying the disease pathophysiology as a basis for developing new treatments. He has made important contributions to understanding the mechanisms of intermittent claudication and the exercise impairment characteristic of PAD. Through a series of clinical investigations, his group, along with collaborators from UCLA, characterized mitochondrial dysfunction in the skeletal muscle of PAD patients, altering the existing paradigm of the pathophysiology of PAD. Dr. Hyatt's team developed the key functional measures in the field and demonstrated the positive effects of exercise training in PAD, leading directly to clinical practice guidelines. Since 2003, Dr. Hyatt has provided critical service to FDA advisory committees, including the Cardiovascular and Renal Drugs Advisory Committee and currently the Endocrinologic and Metabolic Drugs Advisory Committee. Over the last two decades, he has played a leading role in clinical trials on PAD and on the regulation of cardiovascular therapeutics by the FDA. Mark A. Latke, MD, Faha, Dr. Latke is a cardiologist with major research interests in clinical trials, clinical research methods, outcomes research, and comparative effectiveness research. Dr. Latke has participated in many large multi-center randomized clinical trials, including studies of coronary revascularization, treatment of acute myocardial infarction, hormone therapy to prevent cardiovascular disease and management of life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias. He pioneered the collection of data on economic and quality of life outcomes as part of randomized trials, which has become a standard tool in outcomes research. He has also conducted large outcomes research studies of coronary revascularization, sudden cardiac death, implantable cardioverter defibrillators, heart failure, and coronary artery disease. 
he developed decision models to assess the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of a wide variety of clinical strategies, including prevention of sudden cardiac death, use of testing to guide preventive treatment of heart disease, use of genetic testing in cardiovascular medicine, and management of cardiac risk during non-cardiac surgery. Hello, I'm Rosemary Robertson, Chief Science and Medical Officer of the American Heart Association. Scientists like these at the cutting edge of cardiovascular disease and stroke research are the driving force behind our mission to build healthier lives free of cardiovascular diseases and stroke. I'd like to personally congratulate these scientists as they receive the American Heart Association and American Stroke Association's highest scientific award. If you'd like to learn more about the American Heart Association's Distinguished Scientist Award, just go to myamericanheart.org. Now, we'd like to pay tribute to cherished friends of the American Heart Association who have passed away. Each person we are remembering made a significant contribution to our goal of fighting cardiovascular diseases and stroke, and the impact of their work will live on. As their names appear, please pause for a moment of silence. Thank you. The Basic Research Prize recognizes researchers who make significant contributions to the advancement of cardiovascular science and who head outstanding research laboratories. This year's honor goes to Dr. Andre Terzik, Director of Regenerative Medicine and Professor of Cardiovascular Diseases, Medicine and Pharmacology at the Mayo Clinic. Trained as a physician scientist, Dr. Terzik is recognized nationally and internationally for his contributions to cardiovascular medicine and science. He has pioneered multiple cardioprotective and cardioregenerative modalities. In the more than 450 publications he has authored, Dr. Terzik has advanced diagnostic and therapeutic strategies for heart failure. His work includes discovery of genes for dilated cardiomyopathy and atrial fibrillation. 
Dr. Terzak holds diverse patents, and his team's work on the treatment of cardiac diseases led to a biotechnology company launch through initial public offering. Dr. Terzak's contributions include more than two decades in mentoring. He has trained more than 50 physicians, scientists, fellows, and students who have received dozens of prestigious awards and grants. It is now my privilege to introduce the recipient of this year's Basic Research Prize, Dr. Andre Terzak. It is an immense honor to accept the 2014 Basic Research Prize. I take this opportunity to extend my deepest thanks to the American Heart Association, to the Functional Genomics and Translational Biology Councils, to colleagues that have nominated me, and indeed to the whole team at the Mayo Clinic that has worked closely with me over the last two decades. I'm humbled by the award. It reflects a rich history of science and medicine, an enduring paradigm in the advancing the frontiers of healthcare. As we look into the future, the pandemic of cardiovascular disease will mandate new solutions, indeed disruptive innovations, to address the unmet needs of patients and populations across the globe. The unison of fundamental discovery with clinical translation and population application will provide a guiding principle for the generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Terzak. The Clinical Research Prize recognizes an individual who is making outstanding contributions to the advancement of cardiovascular science and who heads a distinguished clinical research laboratory. The recipient of this year's award is Dr. Judith Hockman of the New York University School of Medicine. She is director of the school's Cardiovascular Clinical Research Center and co-director of its Clinical Translational Science Institute. She is also clinical chief of the Division of Cardiology. Dr. Hockman is an internationally recognized pioneer and investigator in clinical cardiovascular research. Her work has led to guidelines and practice-changing findings in the field of acute coronary syndromes. Dr. Hockman has been the driving force for multiple NIH-sponsored trials examining critical, clinically relevant patient management questions. She organized and spearheaded the landmark shock trial that studied the optimal treatment strategy in patients with cardiogenic shock due to acute myocardial infarction. Another achievement was the OAT trial to study whether occluded arteries should be opened in patients who have recently suffered an MI. Currently, she is the study chair for yet another NIH-sponsored study, the ischemia trial, the largest and most comprehensive regarding the optimal management of patients with multivessel coronary artery disease. The findings will have a profound impact on how these patients are managed. Dr. Hockman has been an exceptional investigator and has made an outstanding contribution to the advancement of cardiovascular science. It is my honor to introduce the recipient of the 2014 Clinical Research Prize, Dr. Judith Hockman. Thank you, Elliot, and thank you for all you have done for the AHA and for being such a wonderful colleague through so many years. I would also like to thank the nominating committee and the Council on Car Clinical Cardiology. I am deeply honored to receive this prize. Isaac Newton observed, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulder of giants. If I have achieved anything, 
It is because I have worked hand in hand with hundreds of co-investigators that have played important roles in the challenging trials we've tackled together. Clinical re research is truly a team sport. I am grateful for my terrific colleagues at NYU and elsewhere. Early in my career, there were giants who were wonderful mentors and role models, Eugene Brownwald, Mike Weisfeld, and Bernadine Healy. Before my mentors, there were other giants, my parents who raised me with a love of learning. And now I find inspiration in my sons and grandson, in my many mentees, too numerous to name, whose successes are a great source of pride, including Jennifer Maris, who just received the Chairman's Award. Most importantly, I want to acknowledge and thank my husband, Richard Fuchs, who's here today, who serves the dual role of remarkable life partner and trusted colleague. It's been a privilege to be among the leadership of many trials that have proven the efficacy of new acute coronary syndrome therapies. But equally important in my career was my involvement in several trials with unexpected findings of harm from therapies widely used in practice with profound implications for patient care. HERS and WHI trials that demonstrated harm from hormone therapy and CAST which showed harm from antiarrhythmics. Before these trials, there were huge biases toward using these therapies that made many question, the physicians question the ethics of randomization and made enrollment challenging but the results change clinical practice. I have chaired trials like SHOCK with colleagues whose names you see on this slide that proved the efficacy of an invasive management strategy and OAT, which failed to show a benefit for an invasive strategy. These disparate results point to the importance of continuing to evaluate clinical practice critically with randomized trials, despite widely, despite widely held pre-existing opinions as to which therapies work. I would like to conclude my acceptance with a plea, especially to the next generation, to continue to test medical dogma with traditional randomized trials, despite all the difficulties in carrying them out, and with newer models for clinical trials that maximize engagement of practitioners and patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hockman. The Population Research Prize recognizes an individual who is making outstanding contributions to the advancement of cardiovascular science and who heads a major population research laboratory. This year's recipient is Dr. Vasan Ramachandran, Chief of the Section of Epidemiology and Preventive Medicine in the Department of Medicine at the Boston University School of Medicine. Dr. Ramachandran has an international reputation for his work in cardiovascular epidemiology and is known for his stellar research productivity. He has published cutting-edge research in more than 560 peer-reviewed articles in high-impact journals. Dr. Ramachandran's research has made fundamental contributions to the fields of systemic markers of cardiovascular disease echocardiography in epidemiology research, heart failure risk factors, and hypertension. He has an original research mind and seizes on opportunities to translate cutting-edge basic science into the epidemiologic context, all while adhering to the highest ethical principles in his research and in the treatment of those he supervises. Considered one of the leading cardiovascular epidemiologists Dr. Ramachandran is a revered mentor and teacher. His commitment to mentoring has been recognized by the NIH, which has twice awarded him a prestigious mentoring grant. While developing a distinguished research reputation in the United States, he has not forgotten his country of origin and health issues in the developing world. He continues to collaborate, mentor, and conduct and publish research in India. Please join me in welcoming the recipient of this year's Population Research Prize, Dr. Vasan Ramachandran.
Dear colleagues, I stand before you humbled and honored. I offer my sincerest gratitude to the American Heart Association for this recognition. Foremost, I salute the three generations of Framingham Study participants who have gifted their time, blood, and data altruistically to humanity for over six decades. And a big shout out to my mentors and mentees and colleagues. You made this possible. Thank you. Upon learning of this award, I paused. And I wondered, boy, am I really that old? And I thought I had just begun. Inspired, let me share a dream we still need to create. A Framingham Heart Study without walls, with two additional virtual floors. One, where budding investigators worldwide freely access all our data and make new scientific discoveries. And another flow with international experts and national scientists who will guide us maintain a state-of-the-art 21st century public health laboratory without walls. Wow. On to another dream. 150 years ago, John Snow stopped the cholera epidemic by removing the handle of a pump. 50 years ago, Bill Cannell identified the key risk factors for heart disease. Today, we live with a chilling high lifetime risk of these same risk factors. Together, we all have to shut off this tap so that a child who is born in 2020 lives a different future. As we travel to realize these dreams, I'll end on a personal note. Two decades ago, my daughter and I stopped by the heart study on a snowy morning. It was my fellowship interview. Wading through knee-deep snow, the three-year-old gave her trinkets a shake and asked if there was some mistake. Thus began a life-defining family adventure which continues to date. Today, She's a medical student passionate about public health. I want to acknowledge my wife and partner in this journey for her patience, understanding, support, and love as we walk hand in hand the miles to go before we sleep. Thank you. Congratulations, Dr. Ramachandran. This next award is the Eugene Brownwald Academic Mentorship Award. This award honors a special individual who for at least 20 years has successfully mentored promising young academicians. Every year when I come to sessions and I see the presentation of this award, it resonates very deeply with me not just because Dr. Brownwald is a legend in cardiology who's published more than a thousand original articles, conducted important research, edited a key textbook, and mentored so many of my respected colleagues. This award always hits home for me because I am among those fortunate enough to be one of his mentees during the early phases of my career and remain so even to this day. I would like to thank Dr. Brownwald for all that he has done for me and for all of you in this audience by inviting him to join me in the presentation of the Academic Mentorship Award. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my mentor and friend, Dr. Eugene Brownwald. Well, thank you, Elliot. It's a real pleasure and an honor to join you today for the presentation of this award. The greatest gift that can come to a mentor is to learn from his former mentees 
and there is no one that has taught me more than you have. Uh, this year's award goes to a hero of mine, Dr. Jeremiah Stamler, Professor Emeritus at Northwestern University. Dr. Stamler is one of the founding fathers of cardiovascular epidemiology and prevention. Over the 50 plus years he has directed, we mentored and guided the careers of thousands of people through hands-on mentoring, scientific acumen, and leadership by example. Indirectly, he has had an impact through the founding and leadership of the famous 10-day international seminar and TAHO course, which has trained thousands of leading clinicians and scientists. Dr. Stamler helped to mold the careers of numerous mentees who hold prominent positions in the fields of epidemiology and prevention around the world. The trainees who learned under his leadership are too numerous to count. Dr. Stamler is quite simply a giant in his field. This year, he celebrates his 95th birthday here in his hometown of Chicago as we celebrate his unparalleled mentoring accomplishments and contributions to the American Heart Association. It is therefore my pleasure and my very special honor to pre present the 2014 Academic Mentorship Award to Dr. Jeremiah Stamler. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the American Heart Association for this award. I am, of course, deeply appreciative. It's especially gratifying for me to receive it directly from Dr. Eugene Brownwald himself, a colleague of great distinction of my own generation. Dr. Brownwald and I are both honorary professors in Italy, he at the University of Salerno, I at the University of Naples. My career as an investigator began in 1948 with a research fellowship. My mentor was Dr. Louis Nelson Katz, director of the Cardiovascular Research Institute, Michael Reese Hospital right near here in Chicago. 1948 was the year that the cardiologist leading the American Heart Association, Louis Katz and Paul Dudley White, prominently among them, as you've already heard, worked hard and long to transform AHA from a professional organization to a voluntary health agency. It was my privilege at intervals to sit at the feet of Louis Katz, Paul Dudley White, Howard Sprague, and others as they pursued this task. I was impressed by the programmatic thrusts, professional education, public service, research. I recall the detailed discussions on the importance of training young professionals and the elaborate efforts for training that were undertaken the funding of one- and two-year fellowships, the five-year established investigatorships, etc. I personally benefited as an AHA five-year established investigator. Over the decades since 1948, 
AHA has consistently supported training, thereby playing a key role in creating the troops essential for the effort to prevent and control the cardiovascular disease epidemic. Importantly, that support has included sponsoring and underwriting annual U.S. 10-day seminars on CVD epidemiology and prevention, a unique training effort involving 25 or more younger investigators and other physicians and other health sciences, scientists every year. AHA's contribution to mentorship have not only been national at the World Cardiology Congress in New Delhi in 1966, forceful AHA initiative led to the creation of several international councils. Ansel Keys and I were drafted to organize the Council on Epidemiology and Prevention. One major consequence was the annual 10-day international teaching seminar on CBD epidemiology and prevention launched in 1968, ongoing since. The late Rose Stamler and I participated as core faculty for 24 years, along with the late Dick Remington and the late Jeffrey Rose. Darwin Labarth continues to play a key role in both the national and inter international 10-day seminars. The experience of the international seminars served me well in my mentorship efforts at our Northwestern University Department of Preventive Medicine. So to AHA, much thanks for all of the above, for all that AHA has done to foster training, all that AHA has contributed to my career development, and for this mentorship award. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stamler. The Research Achievement Award recognizes a lifetime of distinguished scientific advancement in cardiovascular research and or teaching. It is my pleasure to recognize Dr. Sean Coughlin, Director of the Cardiovascular Research Institute and Distinguished Professor in Cardiovascular Biology and Medicine at the University of California at San Francisco. Dr. Coughlin is a world leader in platelet biology and has been director of the Cardiovascular Research Institute since 1997. Among his scores of published original research papers is his most famous work on the cloning of the thrombin receptor. This work identified a new family of protease-activated receptors. Dr. Coughlin translated his basic science discoveries involving the PAR family of receptors into a proposal that led to a new antiplatelet drug that promises to reduce death from cardiovascular disease. The PAR1 inhibitor, called Vorapaxar, was recommended for FDA approval on January 15, 2014. For his discoveries, his seminal publications, in the highest tier journals and his proposal that resulted in a promising new drug, Dr. Coughlin is most deserving of this award. It is now my distinct honor to introduce the 2014 recipient of the Research Achievement Award, Dr. Sean Coughlin. Thank you very much, Dr. Antman, and thanks to the American Heart Association. We all stand on each other's shoulders in this business, and my laboratory is no exception. I'm delighted to accept the American Heart Association's Research Achievement Award in recognition of the achievements of many individuals in my laboratory and outside of it, and as a celebration of our field. I'll use my two minutes to draw two lessons from this story. 
First, for the leaders who influence funding policies, uh, this story provides a nice example of how single investigator initiated AHA and NIH funded research aimed at understanding a basic biological mechanism can lead to a new medicine. When I entered this field, platelets were known to uh, contribute to the thrombi that caused myocardial infarction and stroke, uh, and thrombin was known to be a potent activator of platelets ex vivo. But whether thrombin induced platelet activation was an important contributor to cardiovascular events was unknown. Answering this question required first answering a more basic question. How does a protease like thrombin talk directly to a cell like a platelet to trigger a biological response? Discovery and characterization of protease activated receptor 1 or PAR1 provided an elegant answer. PAR1 is in essence a peptide receptor that carries its own ligand until, which stays silent until cleavage by thrombin on mass it such that it can bind to the, the receptor and trigger re receptor activation. Subsequent work confirmed that PAR1 and the related receptor PAR4 mediate platelet activation by thrombin and pointed to PAR1 antagonism as a possible approach to antithrombotic therapy. Recent clinical trials of the PAR1 antagonist for Apaxar indeed provide evidence that PAR1-dependent platelet activation contributes to thrombosis and hemostasis in humans. With Vorpaxar now approved for secondary prevention of cardiovascular events in selected patients. Understanding the roles of uh, PARs beyond platelets remains an exciting area of research. Second lesson uh, for the young people here is I can't imagine a more interesting or rewarding career than cardiovascular research. I've been privileged to work on fascinating problems, experience the joy of new understanding, and thanks to many in academia and industry, see discovery benefit patients not to mention the pleasure of watching one's trainees go on to make their own contributions. The opportunities to understand biology and, and alter disease available today dwarf those of 20 years ago. And there's plenty of great work for those interested in uncovering the language of biology and those in translating what we learn. So if you're able, jump in with both feet. Thank you again for this recognition. Thank you, Dr. Coughlin. Each year, the Lewis A. Connor Memorial Lecture is presented by a distinguished scholar, researcher, or national leader in the health field. The lecture honors the memory of Dr. Connor, one of the founders of the American Heart Association and its first president in 1924. We are privileged today to have as our Connor lecturer Dr. Donald Elliott Ingber, the Judah Falkman Professor of Vascular Biology at the Children's Hospital Boston and Professor of Bioengineering at the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Dr. Ingber received his MD and PhD from Yale University. He is the founding director of the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard University. Dr. Ingber's most recent innovation is organs on a chip technology. The technology builds tiny, complex, three-dimensional models of living human organs as a way to replace animal-based methods for testing drugs and establishing human disease models. Dr. Ingber has authored more than 375 publications and 85 patents. He has numerous honors, including the Holst Medal, the Pritzker Award from the Biomedical Engineering Society, the Roos Whipple Award from the American Society for Investigative Pathology, the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Society of In Vitro Biology, and the Department of Defense Breast Cancer Innovator Award. He serves on the board of directors of the National Space Biomedical Research Institute and is a member of both the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering and the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies. Today he is presenting Biologically Inspired Engineering, From Human Organs on Chips to Nanotherapeutic Clot Busters. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Donald Ingber.
Thank you, Elliot, and thank you all so much for this wonderful honor. Uh, what I'd like to do is pick up on the theme of disruptive innovation that Elliot introduced and tell you a little bit about what we've been doing at the Wies Institute, which, as you can see from our logo, has been in the process of self-assembling over the last five years or so. We've actually grown up, we're now up to about 375 full-time staff, so we're no longer a little startup. <clears throat> I think most of you know that medicine has been transformed over the past 50 years by applying engineering principles to solve medical problems, and that gave us stents and artificial hearts and pacemakers and so forth. But what we feel is that we've actually uncovered enough about how nature builds, controls, and manufactures that we're at a point where we could actually leverage biological principles to develop new engineering innovations. And this is what we call biologically inspired engineering. Now, we were kickstarted with the largest single gift in Harvard's history of $125 million, so we had a chance to, to tackle big problems. And the biggest one I could see, as you heard from Elliot, is that the drug development model is broken. You talk to heads of pharma companies and you often hear the big challenge is to fail quickly and cheaply, which is to me not really a vision for the future. And why, why is it broken? Well, it, it can it can cost over $2 million to test a single drug. Cells cultured in dishes don't function anything like in our bodies. Animal studies are expensive and take a long time. It's ethically a big issue, especially in Europe already, where innumerable animal lives are lost. And then, more often than not, the results don't predict what happens in the clinic. And as a result, the number of medicines that have been approved per dollar invested has just consistently decreased, as you see in that graph, over the past 50 or 60 years. So many groups are set out to come up with better lab models. We uh, made, we at the Wies Institute started a whole platform to focus on this, which I called biomimetic microsystems in I head, and the idea is to engineer microchips containing living human cells that reconstitute organ-level functions, not cell, not tissue, but organ-level functions for drug screening, diagnostic and therapeutic applications to replace animal testing. Now, why microchips? Well, microchip manufacturing offers control over features at the same size scale that living cells and tissues live at. And this is something that I've worked uh, with George Whiteside starting 20 years ago on, both in terms of controlling cell adhesion and function, but also in controlling fluid flow through, use, through creating microfluidics, which are basically microvascular networks that allow you to control flow at that scale. So we made a major breakthrough in 2010 that we call a human breathing lung on a chip. And the idea was to, to, to model the, the major functional unit of the lung, the air sac, or the alve alveolar capillary interface. And what I'm going to show you here is that at the top right, these are made out of clear, optically clear silicon rubber. They're about the size of a computer memory stick. But as you'll see in this video, if you cut that in half, you'll see that it has three channels. The, the middle one's about a millimeter in diameter. The middle one has a horizontal membrane that's porous, made of the same silicon rubber polymer, coated with extracellular matrix. We then take human alveolar epithelial cells and culture them on the top. Human pulmonary capillary endothelial cells when we culture them on the bottom, we just recreated the alveolar capillary interface. And then the trick is that we apply suction through those side channels, and because it's flexible, it rhythmically extends and relaxes and undergoes the same breathing motions that the alveolar cells experience when all of us are breathing in and out right now. We then can flow air over the top to create an air-liquid interface, and we can flow medium or even blood, if you like, through the bottom to mimic the bloodstream and the vascular channel. Now, if this works, we would expect that we can model complex organ-level responses, for example, inflammation or infection. So if we were to have bacteria, for example, in the airspace, the cells would, would get inflamed and the endothelial cells would be activated, express adhesion receptors like ICAMs, selectins, and immune cells should stick, roll, and then diapodes through, where they, they would then engulf the bacteria on the other side. What I'm now going to show you is high-resolution, real-time imaging. Those are human white blood cells, fresh cells. I know they're fresh because we took them out of my postdoc. Um, and w we label them, and you don't see the epithelial endothelial cells. Under control conditions, it's a quiescent endothelium. They just flow by. But if you put bacteria or cytokines on the opposite sides, they get activated and the immune cells stick. And now we could go to high-resolution imaging, just like in a culture dish, and you're going to see one cell come in 
there's a pentagons with holes in the membrane. There's one white blood cell, and about here it finds a space between two endothelial cells. It goes through, finds the hole, it wiggles its rear end through that hole in the matrix in the membrane, and then it comes out on the other side, as you can see now, by phase. And now I'm going to show you the white blood cells in red and the bacteria in GFP labeled green, and you will see the, that the white cells engulf those bacteria. You've just watched the entire human inflammatory response in real time at high resolution in this little rubber chip. That is an organ on a chip. Now, we then tested um, more complex responses. We used nanoparticulates that, are, that mimic airborne particulates and smog that could exacerbate asthma or, or, or arrhythmias, for example. And we can measure injury by measuring reactive oxygen species with uh, microfluorimetry. And very interestingly, what we found is if that you had either breathing alone or these particles alone, there was no response. But if you had physiological breathing and these nanoparticles, you saw ROS production. And as you can see at the right, you get an inflammatory response as well. Furthermore, we could measure bioavailability and adsorption. So if we gave the nanoparticles particles to the airspace, what you see is that we got an eight to tenfold increase in particles that went across two cell layers and into the vascular system and were absorbed. There was no change in fluorescent dextrin or albumin. This seems to be a specific response, but only in the presence of breathing motions. Without breathing, very little got across. Now, this is not mimicking physiology. This is a prediction. So we actually developed an ex vivo ventilation perfusion model in the mouse, and we found exactly the same thing. And so this was why it was a full article in science. Now, we showed this to a lot of pharmaceutical companies, and they were impressed, but they said, you know, we, what we really need are disease models. So we developed a model of pulmonary edema fluid on the lungs, and we used interleukin-2, which is an FDA-approved cancer drug, but its major dose-limiting side effect is pulmonary vascular permeability. We introduced it at the same dose in, in IV through the vascular channel, and as you see in the top right, when you look from above in the air, when there's air in the channel, you can barely see the cells. But when we give this drug in the vascular channel, we see a meniscus filling the air channel that over four, three to four days completely fills it with fluid. And that is the same exact time course with the same dose that produces pulmonary edema in humans. We could quantitate this by using fluorescent inulin, like kidney physiologists do. And you could see at the top right that, again, you could see the shift of fluid with breathing motions, but without breathing motions, there was very little effect. So once again, we went back in Viva, and we confirmed that this is physiologically relevant also. I will say a quick side note. When we submitted this paper to Science Translation Medicine, one reviewer said this should not be published. It's oversimplified. There were no immune cells. The other reviewer said, this is amazing. They just showed you don't need immune cells for pulmonary edema induced by interleukin-2, and luckily it got in. And so you could actually learn things, because these are synthetic systems that you build up. If you don't get a response, you add back more cells, more complexity. Now, I've worked for 30 years in mechanobiology, and one of the fastest mechanotransduction mechanisms we found is through an ion channel called TRIPV4. And because we saw mechanics was so important, and I knew GlaxoSmithKline was working on inhibitors, we collaborated, and they gave us an inhibitor, and we tested it, and we completely prevented pulmonary edema in this human in vitro model of, of, of vascular permeability. In parallel, they took this drug, tested it in dogs and rabbits with cardiogenic pulmonary edema and found the same thing. We actually published back-to-back -back papers in science translation medicine. So this one model has demonstrated the, the proof of principle for drug efficacy, drug toxicity, and human disease modeling in using organs on chips. But we didn't stop there. Uh, Kit Parker, who's going to be speaking on Tuesday afternoon, as you heard, has developed a beating heart on a chip, which um, you can measure the contractile stress by measuring how these little flexible cantilevers bend with living cells on it. And at the bottom right, and he's hopefully going to tell you about this, he used human iPS cells, cardiac myocytes from human iPS cells, and was able to model Barth syndrome and see the compromise functionality, both by taking cells from patients and actually using CRISPR-based genome editing to make a model of it. And he actually got new insight to the disease. That's his story. I'll let him talk about it. We've begun to link the heart on a chip to the lung on a chip. And um, just real preliminary result, we could actually show, for example, giving doxyrubicin to the lung through the airspace, we could see a dose-dependent inhibition of the contractility in the heart. And uh, this was done with Kit's initial system right across the epithelium to the vascular channel to his heart. But now he's put an endothelium in his system so we can go endothelium to endothelium. 
We didn't stop there. We recently, and this is unpublished, we developed what we call a small airway on a chip because pharmaceutical companies were interested in asthma and COPD. We took the same chip. We made the, the height of the channel a millimeter to mimic a radius of a two millimeter bronchiole. We took primary human bronchiolar epithelial cells, and vivo is shown at the bottom right. They normally grow as a pseudostratified ciliated epithelium. We put the cells culture them, give them an air-liquid interface, and we get a pseudostratified epithelium, and there's endos on the bottom. More importantly, if you stain them for cilia and mucus, you get, and this is across a millimeter of channel, you get incredible, beautiful uh, ciliated epithelium, which if you look at electron microscopic level, looks like the human bronchiole in vivo. And more importantly, they actually beat. And if you give them fluorescent particles, you could visualize mucociliary ciliary clearance, and this is in real time. It's moving the same real time movement as I'm clearing my throat here. That's happening on this chip. And just, this is a comparison. I won't go into it because of time, but the cilia beating frequency and structure and velocity and percents of cells are basically identical on chip and in the human. Now, we started to model diseases, and um, we, for example, began with mimicking viral inf infection using poly-IC. And what you can see here is on chip, I won't go into details, but you get multiple cytokines that are known to be induced in humans that, are, for example, re induce monocyte recruitment. And we could flow the cells through, and they are recruited through the endothelium and onto the chip. Recently, we've attained cells from human patients with COPD, and we put them on the chip, made normal and diseased uh, air, uh, bronchioles on the chip. And you see at the left, it's well known that COPD patients in vivo have decreased expression of TLR3 and 4 receptors. We retain that on the chip. It's also known that they have increased exacerbations by viral and, and bacterial infection. And as shown here, this is LPS endotoxin and poly-IC to mimic virus. And compared to normal, we get a significantly increased exacerbation on chip. So we really think these can be modeled with high fidelity, uh, used to model with high fidelity human disease processes. Another organ, we've published a peristaltic human gut on a chip. We took the same lung on a chip. We made it wider, higher. We gave it peristaltic-like deformations, trickling-like flow. We plated them with uh, human intestinal epithelial cells, CACO2 cells that the pharmaceutical industry uses. They normally culture them on transwall as a flat monolayer. They're poorly differentiated. We put them in one day, as shown at the bottom. They're a monolayer. But three days later, we get an intestinal a villa, intestinal villi across the entire width of the chip. This is in vitro across a millimeter. Now the villus has a very particular architecture. It's well known, has a proliferative crypt where the stem cells are. They then divide, move up, differentiate it into the four lineages of the intestine. If we label for growth for two hours, they're in the crypts. They then migrate up and differentiate into all four lineages of small intestine. If you look at transepithelial resistance, this is a trans well. This is our chip. This is paracellular permeability. This is our chip. This is cell differentiation. This is P450, which is very important for the pharmaceutical industry in vivo, but you never see it in vitro in these intestinal cells. That's in vitro. This is in our chip. And this is mucus production, which you don't see in vitro. Now, across with gene microarrays, across 22,000 genes, oh, I'm sorry, with, with, in red at the top left are quadruplicate in a static transwall culture. They're red, meaning they're basically all the same. You just give them trickling flow, they're totally different cells. You give them flow plus peristalsis, they're totally different cells again. I tell my students they're no bad cells, just like they're no bad kids. They get into a bad group of friends or a bad microenvironment. You bring them home, you may be able to, to get it back to, to normal. Now, because we have flow and, and mucus and barrier and differentiation, we can grow microbiome which to me is the major paradigm shift in medicine, and nobody could culture these. So these are human gut cells with, with uh, human-derived uh, lactobacillus commensal bacterium. I'm sorry. Um, and what you can see here is that if you do a trans well, you put bacteria on it, it's contamination. You lose a barrier in 24 hours. You put these on our chip, you get better barrier function, which is why people take probiotics. Uh, for intestinal function. We've now, here you see eight different probiotic bacteria living in the crypts. They're wiggling if you look carefully and they stay in the crypts. In contrast, if you give pathogenic enteroinvasive bacteria, they overgrow completely. And we actually now are modeling inflammatory bowel disease by adding immune cells. 
So we have about 10 or 15 different organs that we're developing, but because we have a vascular channel in these, a few years ago I suggested the idea is that we could create a human body on chips. You can imagine you could have an aerosol-based drug go through the lung, get absorbed, be metabolized by the liver, peed out by the kidney, see if you have heart tox, and see if you affect bone metabolism or oral drug the same way. And we were very lucky to get one of two major grants from DARPA to do just this. Uh, and I, this is a, a grant I'm work, working on with Kit Parker and John Wicksville from Vanderbilt and CFDRC. And the idea was to build basically a CD player, a multi-CD player, where each CD could hold the chip and you could just plug in heart, liver, lung, kidney, or five hearts or whatever order, generate data, and then with computational modeling do PKPD from human cells to try to mimic what happens in vivo. We've had this for a little over two years. I should say we've partnered with Sony DADC. They make CDs. They don't see a big future in it with iTunes, and so they're getting into biology very quickly. And so we've made a, a lot of progress starting two years ago in the summer. This is every student had tubes coming out of the chips. There was one pump per chip, maybe two chips per whole incubator, tubes going out to vacuum control. We now have everything integrated in, into a chip. There's no tubes. It's all in there. We actually have a simpler system since then. And Last November, we developed our first prototype of this, what we call the interrogated device, which now could do, in that it could do 12 different organs, and now we're up to 36, and it has high resolution, three color fluorescent imaging. Um, and we hit milestones where we could keep 10 different organs alive for a week, we've now done two weeks. We could show physiological coupling between two, two different sets of two organs, and based on that, for full disclosure, we just started a company called Emulate, of which I'm on the Scientific Advisory Board and hold equity. Um, so I should say all the data was done before that, so you can trust me. Um, now, the reason this is disruptive innovation is because I think right now the way we develop drugs is we take 15 years and a half a billion dollars, we design a huge clinical trial like you heard, 20,000 patients. We usually fail. And then we do statistical number crunching to find the genetic subpopulation that may be responded. And if you're lucky, you design a small trial and you get it approved. With this sort of approach, you could literally develop iPS cells from genetic subpopulations, put them on chips, develop drugs in a focused program for a subpopulation, have your clinical trial subpopulation, and hopefully accelerate this. And I think this can really change the way things are done. So before I end, I just want to give you two other examples of disruptive innovation. My platform is just one of six, another is called Programmable Nanomaterials, and the idea is to create smart medical nanotechnologies to go from implantable medical devices to injectable medical devices, and I have targeted cardiovascular medicine and drug delivery. Now, as you know, uh, the major causes of death in man are heart attack, stroke, pulmonary embolism, atherosclerosis, and they all share the cause of vascular occlusion, often due to a clot. And so, as you know, they're great clot-busting drugs like TPA, but only 4 to 5 percent of patients are eligible because of bleeding, hemorrhage, side effects often into the brain. So we said, what if we could get this drug just to the clot and nowhere else? And we thought, well, how would you do that? And we said, well, platelets do that. That's why platelets get activated when you have a narrowing of the vessel and you get a, a, a clot to form in the first place. So what we came up with we called platelet mimetics, and the idea is we took FDA-approved PLGA nanoparticles, about 180 meter nanometers, 180 nanometers in diameter. We use um, spray drying to form little clumps, as you see here, that are the size of platelets. And you could think of them like a wet ball of sand. If I shape wet sand, it's round. If I shear it in my hands, they fall to grains. This is tuned to fall to grains at, a, at only abnormally high levels of shear stress above about 100 dyne per centimeter squared. So the idea would be, that if you inject it into the vessel, it would travel around like a platelet. But whenever you had, wherever you had an occlusion, high shear stress would activate them. They would deploy into small nanoparticles that would have less drag force. If they were coated with TPA, they'd bind fibrin. And then they would degrade it and keep degrading it. And if a bit flew off, it would travel with it and keep degrading it. And we actually developed a model in vitro in microfluidics with preformed clot, and you actually see these clots degrade in vitro, just like I said. So we went and we developed an in vivo model, and we developed a model of pulmonary embolism in the mouse. We formed a clot, injected it, occluded the pulmonary artery, and 100% of the mice died in 45 minutes. We then were able to save 80% of the animal's lives with a single injection of this nanotherapeutic. But the important point is we used one hundredth 
the dose of TPA. That is basically almost a homeopathic dose. It doesn't do anything to systemic bleeding. So you could begin to envision a future where you could inject this in an ambulance and you could still do cardiac catheterization because you wouldn't have systemic bleeding. And we're trying to advance this towards, uh, we've already moved it to larger animal models and have some exciting results. And to end, one other example uh, is inspiration from the non-medical world. The, the Institute doesn't just do medicine, we do industrial applications and environmental applications because I always felt there may be things out there we've never heard of that could have value. Joanna Eisenberg was trying to develop ways to prevent ice sticking from airplane wings and she developed a non-stick surface coating called SLIP, slippery liquid infused porous surfaces. She was inspired by the pitcher plant in Africa, as shown here, which in the dry season, plant, insects can crawl all over, but when it, becomes wet, when it becomes wet, they just slide in. It's like a black hole, if you look carefully. They're just falling to the center, and they get eaten like a Venus flytrap, and that's because it's like slip, sliding on water. She then used nanotechnology to create artificial surfaces and put a silicon oil or a perfluorocarbon oil on the top, to mimic this, and now you have some, this is crude oil, one of the stickiest things in the world, and it does not stick at all to the surface, and you could injure it, and because it flows back in, it's self-healing. Now, I was challenged on a project to develop a way to make surfaces non-adhesive for blood, to actually have a surface that's completely anticoagulant, and I thought, well, what if, what if we could use this, but we wanted to use FDA-approved medical devices that already have GMP manufacturing, and we couldn't, like, structure the surface. So we wanted to do it on a smooth surface. And we recently accomplished this by developing what we call a tethered liquid perfluorocarbon method, where we take a perfluorocarbon that we covalently link, and then we add a thin layer of liquid perfluorocarbon to create the, 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 the liquid surface. So you have sort of oil-liquid, oil-water, oil-blood interface. And what happens if you put blood on this surface, as shown here, this is acrylate, that's, that's fresh human blood without heparin on the left that clots, that's the coated surface on the right. At the bottom, we took a clinical AV shunt, arteriovenous shunt, coated it with this method, put it in a pig for eight hours and had absolutely no clotting, whereas the other uncoated ones clotted. And this was the cover of Nature Biotech last month. And I, I, I just, I, I tell you this, these are just a glimmer of what we're doing at the Wies Institute. Um, but the, the answer to disruptive innovation is people. And it's getting people together from many different disciplines, each of which is passionate about solving a big problem, but they know they can't do it alone. And if you bring them together, amazing things happen. And with that, I invite you to our website. We won the Webby a couple of years ago, which is the Academy Award of the Internet. Uh, we beat out NASA Space Propulsion Lab and Wired Magazine, and I hope you come. I think you'll enjoy it. Thank you so much for this honor. Thank you, Dr. Engber, for the inspirational lecture. Now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Robert Harrington, chairman of our Committee on Scientific Sessions program. He's the chairman of the Department of Medicine and the Arthur L. Bloomfield Professor of Medicine at the Stanford University School of Medicine in Palo Alto, California. Please welcome Dr. Harrington. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Committee on Scientific Sessions Program and the American Heart Association, I want to welcome you to Scientific Sessions 2014. We have a terrific program planned for you in this great city of Chicago, and maybe some of that snow will keep all of you indoors to enjoy the offerings over the next few days. First, truly, to put together a meeting like Scientific Sessions takes a village. I want to thank our large and very diverse Committee on Scientific Sessions programming for all the hard work that went into planning this meeting. I want to particularly acknowledge the Vice Chair of the Committee, Frank Selke, and the President, Elliot Antman. I'd also like to ask us to pause for a moment and remember a friend and colleague to many of us, Ken Block, who passed away far too early this past fall. Ken was an enthusiastic, passionate, committed HA volunteer. In one of his most recent roles for the Heart Association,
He served as the vice chair of the Committee on Scientific Session Programming. Ken was passionate about science, he was passionate about early career investigators, and he will be very missed. Following last year's successful scientific sessions in Dallas, we reached out to the community and to many of you and asked you, what do you want to see at your scientific sessions? As Clyde Yancey has said, you asked, we listened, and we delivered. We really think that you're going to enjoy this meeting, and now I'm going to spend a few minutes walking you through what you can expect over the course of the next few days. This really is the world's greatest showcase of cardiovascular science and medicine. The best science is presented here at scientific sessions, and this year's scientific sessions in Chicago is no exception. We have more than 5,000 presentations, including 4,000 abstracts of original science. There's more than 1,000 invited faculty. And this is one of the only meetings that you will see science across the continuum, from basic discovery to translation to clinical research and ultimately to population health. We have more than 200 exhibitors in our technology hall and late-breaking clinical trials remains a cornerstone of the excitement of the meeting. Let me give you an overview of what the meeting looks like. We have almost 900 sessions, of which 560 are original research sessions. In those original research sessions, we've structured most of the original science as poster presentations this year. And we'll come back to that in a moment as I explain the thinking of the committee in doing this. We have four late-breaking clinical trial sessions, five clinical, trial special, clinical science special report sessions, and all of this totals almost 600 original research sessions. There are over 300 invited sessions, plenary sessions, special sessions, and a number of other sessions that, again, I'll get to and discuss with you in some detail. We know that a meeting like scientific sessions can be daunting. While it's great to have every type of science being presented, navigating that meeting across the continuum from basic to population health science can be a challenge. The Programming Committee has organized this for you in an attempt to help you navigate the meeting more readily. There are 26 tracks going across those four pillars of science, and this involves all the major cardiovascular specialties as well as multiple domains of science. Always, the late-breaking clinical trial sessions prove to be one of the more newsworthy aspects of scientific sessions, and this year is certainly no exception. We have an outstanding group of trials, of presenting trialists, commentators, moderators, and panelists to try to give you not just the presentation, but an in-depth look at some of the questions that emerge from the data. We hope you'll join us right after this session for the first late-breaking clinical trial session at 345 on the risk and benefits of dual antiplatelet therapy, where a number of trials, including the dual antiplatelet therapy study, will be presented. We'll kick off tomorrow's late-breaking clinical trials with lipid lowering and the prevention of coronary disease. Included in this session will be the primary results from the Improve It study. On Tuesday, we have a fabulous late-breaking trial session devoted to the treatment of structural heart disease. And I want to call out specifically that two of the trials in this session are NHLBI-supported clinical trials, one through the Pediatric Heart Network and one through the Cardiothoracic Surgical Network. In this era of constrained funding, the ability of the NHLBI to do clinical trials in populations that are frequently underrepresented is deeply appreciated by the cardiovascular community. The final session on Wednesday will look at ischemic heart disease, drugs, devices, and systems of care. So we hope you join us for all of the late-breaking trial sessions over the next few days. On Wednesday, we'll be piloting a new entity at scientific sessions, and this is the next best thing in cardiovascular science. We've asked representatives of our 16 science councils to present to you in rapid five-minute fashion 
what they think will be the next big thing in their area of science or clinical medicine. There are special lectures being offered this week. Bob Lefkowitz will present the Nobel Laureate Lecture, and it should be noted that Dr. Lefkowitz was an AHA-funded investigator earlier in his career. Rob Califf, also from Duke, will present the Distinguished Scientist Lecture. You've heard from Elliot that Lars Valentin from Uppsala will present the Paul Dudley White International Lecture, and there will be a special presentation on a patient's perspective of living with cardiovascular disease for several decades. And this will be a lecture and presentation by former Vice President Dick Cheney. We've heard from attendees that while they appreciate the scope and the broadness of sessions, they want more intimacy. They want to be engaged with their colleagues around a specific area of science. We listen to this and with the help of our electrophysiology colleagues have planned a one-day meeting in a meeting on, the arith on arrhythmias in the Arrhythmia Research Summit. We hope that you'll join us for this as we look at arrhythmias, again, across the spectrum from basic science to population health. Another meeting within the meeting is the ever-popular Global Congress. This year, led by Mikhail Kosobar and Chris O'Donnell, the Global Congress is concentrating on big data. This meeting opened this morning with a standing room only audience in SC. It'll be in there over the next several days, S101C. And you'll see topics covered like outcomes research, mobile health, basic science with a specific emphasis on genomics, and utilizing the EMR for research and learning healthcare systems. Very popular and started a few years ago, appropriately enough, when scientific sessions were in Los Angeles, case theaters provide an opportunity to learn at the movies. These are presentations of taped cases that have been taped and edited to facilitate your education around a clinical case. We've expanded it this year to include not just coronary cases, but structural heart disease, vascular surgery, cardiac thora cardiothoracic surgery, electrophysiology, and the management of heart failure. These are moderated sessions with expert panels to walk through the cases. Don't miss these. Opportunities abound for networking at sessions. We have a number of named lectures, a lot of <coughs> researchers, clinicians, nurses attending the meeting, and the number of 17,000 has now been updated to almost 20,000 attendees at this meeting here in Chicago. We are truly a global meeting at Scientific Session. Almost 30% of our faculty is international. Approximately half of our original science comes from outside the United States. And in celebration of that, and in collaboration with 17 other professional organizations, the AHA will host 17 joint sessions on a variety of scientific topics over the next few days. The Scientific Programming Committee has really realized that what you want in science is a discussion with colleagues. And so, as I said, almost 90% of the abstracts are going to be presented in poster form, and we have a number of enhancements to try to interest you, engage you, and get you talking to colleagues and presenters about their science in the poster hall. One example is the e-abstract sessions at many theaters in the poster hall. You'll also find networking lounges throughout. We have poster professors, senior faculty, who will visit every single poster and lead a discussion with that poster presenter about their science. We're specific, specifically interested in senior investigators talking and discussing about science with early career attendees. Come by the basic science poster reception and celebration of the best of basic science and late-breaking basic science tomorrow evening in the poster hall from 4 to 6. And throughout the, throughout the convention center, you can use kiosks to visit e-posters and even post a question for the presenter to discuss with you what you think are the key questions about their science. 
be sure to visit other places for networking, the Faha Lounge, the Member Circle, the Early Career Engagement Lounge. And please stop by AHA Heart Quarters located in the Science and Technology Hall. We have Science Subcommittee's Collaboration Station. If you're interested in science from the AHA, stop by and learn about the different science subcommittees. Maybe you'll sign up, volunteer, to work on one of those science subcommittees with AHA. We have new technology to help you understand and follow the meeting this year. The mobile meeting guide, please go to the, go to the app store and download under AHA events the mobile meeting guide. It's fantastic and will allow you easily to make your way through and navigate your attendance at the meeting. We have a new offering this year. All sessions are being live streamed. So don't worry if you can't make it to the other end of the lecture hall. Listen to it by live streaming. If one of your fellows is presenting, you can listen to them even if you're in a remote location. And in several of the rooms this year, we have a new application called Conference Note application. Again, in the App Store, Conference Note, use the code HEART14. You can use it in this room, the Special Room, the Global Congress Room, or the Nursing Symposia Room. All slides will be available to you, and not just available to you, but you can take notes on them on your iPad, and you can take that home with you and share that information with your colleagues. Tomorrow afternoon, in a collaboration with entrepreneurs, technologists, AHA volunteers, and Heart Association leadership, there will be a competition in the Science Exhibit Hall with the AHA's Heart Tech Competition. Stop by tomorrow afternoon for this and look at innovative startup companies competing with one another in this space. Don't miss. Tomorrow, wear red for the Go Women campaign. Sign up for the second annual walking challenge. As a community, we walked 10 million steps last year. See if we can top that this year. Wear your sneakers on Tuesday. Wear them with your, with your business suit. Allows you to get through the conference hall a bit more readily and celebrates physical activity and heart health. We have truly early career attendees at sessions local high school students being sponsored by the Midwest affiliate of the American Heart Association. Please greet them, talk to them, if you see them walking through the convention center. And finally, I thanked at the beginning the CSSP group for their contribution, but truly nothing takes place at this meeting without the work of very dedicated staff. So please join me in thanking them and enjoy your meeting. Great job. Great job, Dr. Harrington. Thank you. Before we close, I would like to thank all of our members and guests for being with us today and to recognize our speakers and awardees for their outstanding accomplishments. That concludes our opening session. Thank you all for coming.